grab your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 14. If you, if you haven't picked up on the theme of the songs this morning, we're gonna talk about the Red Sea this morning. And so grab your Bibles, Exodus chapter 14. You can grab your devices as well. It'll be up on the screen, Exodus chapter 14. We talked about some of it last week, so this is kind of part two of this journey um, as, we, as we continue working through the book of Exodus this year. The people of God, the Israelites, the Hebrews, have been slaves in Egypt for 430 years. God has intervened to miraculously rescue them through mighty acts that we call the 10 plagues. And they're on their way out of of slavery and they come to what we call the Red Sea. Uh, Biblically speaking, it's called the Sea of Reeds. So we don't know of a Red Sea historically, but we know of places called the Sea of Reeds. We'll talk about more of that in here in just a, a bit. What I wanna do this morning is I wanna read the entirety of Exodus chapter 14. I wanna read the whole chapter out loud. We're gonna read through this, and then I wanna go back through uh, just to really pick it apart and study what God is saying here. You're gonna notice a couple of things as we read through it. Look for the words that make your mind think about um, a separation or a division, a distinction. Look for those kinds of words. Uh, Look for words that would be reminiscent of fear, and then look for words that are reminiscent of something like faith. So those, those themes are gonna come out for us throughout this passage. So Exodus chapter 14, Let's just read through the entire thing. Again, it'll be up on the screen. On the screen now will be the verses I'm gonna to use throughout this morning. So this is all the references that I will use this morning. If you wanna take a picture of that or write this down in your notes, I just want you to see, I'm not making this up. This is throughout scripture. One dangerous thing in studying scripture is that I, I could read Exodus 14 and just make it say whatever I want it to say based on what I wanted you to hear this morning. But when we place it in the context of the entire narrative of scripture, I can't do that. And so I want you to see these scriptures as a way to reinforce what I believe God is showing us this morning through Exodus chapter 14. So let's begin. Exodus 14, verse one. The Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back. So now they're leaving Egypt and God tells them to turn back and encamp in front of pi Hahirath between Migdal and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon, and you shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say to the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land, the wilderness has shut them in, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, and they did so. When the king of Egypt, that's Pharaoh, was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, what is this we have done? that we have let Israel go from serving us. So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots. So when you read chariots, I want you to think tanks. That's what's coming after them. This is their version of a tank. These chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army and overtook them and camped at the sea by pi in front of Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, that's Yahweh. And they said to Moses, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. They're not wrong. And Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. The people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh, the Lord, when I've gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness. 
and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And the Pharaoh, the Egyptians pursued and went in after them in the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and his horsemen. And in the morning watch the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down at the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel. For the Lord, Yahweh, fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, and the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. And so Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. There was not a remnant. Verse 29, but the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus, Yahweh, the Lord, saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power of the Lord, that's Yahweh, used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant, Moses. So that's the story. Many of us who grew up in church, we know this story. We saw this story played out on flannel graphs in children's church. We have seen it in movies. We've seen churches try to be creative and do it um, at some sort of a production. Like this, this is the moment. For Jews, even until this day, this is the moment that Israelites, Hebrews or Jews, they always call back on this moment. In fact, if you read through the Psalms, uh, close to 20 different Psalms reference the parting of the Red Sea. This is a significant moment in the lives of the Israelites. But there's something in here that I wanna look at this morning, and this is the idea of fear. But not fear uh, like when you're watching a scary movie but fear by means of like losing security, fear of the future, fear that what you thought was going to be may not actually be what is going to be. We have a now six-year-old girl in our house, and um, that means that we know all of the emotions really well. And we know all of them within 10 minutes. We know all of them. You get all of them all at once. Uh, and, and as she's getting older, those, those feelings, they're getting bigger. They're just getting a lot bigger and they change so rapidly. Anybody else can testify to this? How, oh my gosh, it's like whiplash. I don't, I don't know what's happening. There was one moment uh, not too long ago where she was just crying so hard that she started laughing, like a horror movie kind of laugh. Like I don't, we should all get out of the house and just let her start a fire. It should be fine. We should be fine. Well, it comes to the point now where Meredith will sit down with her and she'll ask her this question. Do, do you like being sad? Because it seems like you, you do this a lot. Like, do you like being sad? That's the question that we ask her a lot. Last night, I got to introduce Landry to the idea of being hangry. Anybody know what being hangry is? Yeah. So she, she had lost her mind. I mean, it's 530 and she's just, she's lost it. Can't figure out anything that will make her happy. Nothing. Nothing makes her happy. Uh, unicorns are now the devil, and I can't figure out what I'm gonna talk to her about. And so what we've learned is, baby, you just, you just gotta get some food in your tummy. You gotta eat. Like you need some carbs. You need something to settle all that down. And so we get her to the dinner table, and she's mad because now she doesn't like spaghetti that she liked the night before. Anybody else like that? Like now all of a sudden she hates it. She just hates it. It was her favorite thing, and be, now because it's Saturday, I can't eat it on Saturdays, Dad. You should know that by now. So she begins to eat, and all of a sudden, sweet, joyful Landry comes back. And Meredith asks her, does it feel better now that you've eaten? And she just says, yes, I feel a lot, I feel a lot better now. Yes, thank you for feeding me, mother. This has been wonderful. <laughs> so I introduced her, I say, hey, baby, this is what's called being hangry. She's like, you mean angry? I'm like, no, 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 this is a whole different angry than what you're thinking. What I'm saying is you're angry because you're hungry. This is, this is what's happened for you. Like you, I don't, you became someone else when that happened. So I'm introducing her to what that is. 
So um, what, we're, what psychologists and sociologists have learned and what we've been coming to tell people, Jeff probably tells people this very same thing in counseling. I learned this in my counseling classes. Anger is a secondary emotion. Anger comes from something else. Anger is not the root. Anger is secondary. It, it builds on top of something else. This is what, what anger is. So for Landry and for many of us um, in the room today, particularly of the female persuasion, um, hunger makes you angry. Right, you just, you're angry. That anger comes from something else. That's what it comes from. Two big things that anger comes from is fear or sadness. Fear or sadness. But here's what I'm growing to learn about us, particularly um, in the past two and a half years or so. I think we like being angry as a human people. I think we just like it. I think we look for reasons to be angry. I think it feels comfortable to be angry. I, I just, I have come to believe that I think we actually like it. I think that's why we love social media because it makes us angry. And we like the feeling of being angry. I, I really think we do. Like, I really think we enjoy that just, that low hum of agitation constantly. We just love it. When our kids were first born, um, to get them to sleep, we would use like water sounds or white noise. Anybody else use white noise for your kids? And we thought it was just for the kids. And we had baby monitors in our room. And then we've come to learn whenever we go away on vacation, Meredith and I, or we go on an anniversary trip and there's no sounds, we're like, well, maybe it was for us. Maybe that was for us. Anger is like that. Anger is like a white noise that actually we find comfort in it. For some strange reason, we like feeling angry. It comforts us. I think it makes us feel like we're doing something productive. I think that's why we like it. Because we see evil in the world and then we get angry about it and we think, well, at least I'm angry. I'm not gonna do anything, but I'm gonna tweet about it and I'm gonna Facebook about it all day long so people know that I'm angry. And what we like about social media is that it gets other people who are angry to join in our anger with us. And we like that. We like the community of anger. We enjoy that together. Let's all be angry about the same thing. And if you're not angry about what I'm angry about, then I'm angry at you. That's just, thank you. I'm trying really hard, Kylie, and no one else is getting it, but you are. I think we like it. I really do. I think we like it. I think, um, I think we actually enjoy election cycles. I know you say you hate them. You love it. Gosh, you love it. It gives you something to talk about. It gives you something to be angry about. It gives you something to feel like we like it. Um, we loved being angry about COVID. We like being angry about church. We like being angry about public education. I think we just like it. I think we like being angry about the weather. Like, I, I really do. I think we like being mad that it rains when we want it to be sunny and it's sunny when we want it to rain. I think we just like it. There's something about anger that we just get used to. That I think it becomes a comfort. It almost becomes like a weighted blanket to us. And we actually look for reasons to be angry. We look for reasons to be angry at our family. We look for reasons to be angry at our spouse. We look for reasons to be angry at the world. We look for reasons to be angry at our kid's t-ball coach because my five-year-old's gonna be a pro and I don't understand why you're not starting him. I don't understand what the deal is. I think we like it. What we don't like is digging beneath the anger to figure out what's actually going on. And we'd rather not feel the fear or the sadness and we'd rather just feel the anger. Kim Pratt, who's a licensed um, clinical social workers, says this in an article on Psychology Today. It said, essentially, anger can be a means of creating a sense of control and power in the face of vulnerability and uncertainty. We like anger because it makes us feel like we're in control. That's why we like anger. It makes us feel like whatever's underneath it, the fear or the sadness that we can't control at least this makes us feel like we're in control. So we actually look for it. We actually look for reasons to be angry. And some of us are just the hardest people to please. Like no matter who's in office, no matter what the policy is, we're gonna find a way to be angry about it. No matter who the pastor is, no matter what the passage is, no matter what the schedule is, we're gonna find a reason to be angry about it. No matter what the songs are or what the instruments are, we're gonna find a reason to be mad about it. Because last week you were mad the drums were too loud and this week you're mad we don't have drums. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. 
but it creates this sense of control and power. It makes us feel like we are in charge. So what I wanna do is I wanna walk back through this passage in Exodus 14, and I want to show you a couple of things. I want, I want to show you that the Egyptians and the Israelites were both responding out of fear that had led them to anger. I wanna show you it. And then I wanna show you how that manifests itself, particularly in, in the hearts and souls of the Israelites. But then what I wanna do at the end is I wanna show us, I wanna walk us through a way that we don't have to be angry anymore. A way that we can actually find joy in following Jesus. That we don't have to be angry Pharisees. That we can actually enjoy following Jesus. So let's look at this. Exodus chapter 14, verses one and two essentially tell us that God had led the people of Israel on a wild goose chase. And he had essentially led them down one way, up another, and he had turned them around back to where they're facing the Tower of Migdal, which is like a fortress. And then they're facing where the Egyptians are coming from. And at their back is what we call the Sea of Reeds. We've come to know it as the Red Sea. That's at their back. But God did it for a purpose. Look at verse three of Exodus chapter 14. Because when Pharaoh will say to the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land, the wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host. And the Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh, the one true God. And so they did so. And when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, what is this we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us? So right here, what we're seeing is Pharaoh and the Egyptian army, what they recognized is we've made the biggest mistake of our nation's history in letting 2 million slaves just walk away. They were the ones who were building everything for the Egyptians. The reason the Egyptians had what they had as an empire was due in large part to the work of the Israelites. And so Pharaoh recognizes, what have I just done? That's another way of of admitting, I'm fearful about the future without them. I hate them, but I love them. And I need them here with me. And so Pharaoh is fearful of this future without the comfort of the slaves around him. Now, let's go down to verse 10. The Egyptians are getting closer and closer and they see them. Verse 10, when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes. That's intentional. They lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. They saw them coming, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. And they said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? Now, we don't understand how sarcastic of a statement that is. Egypt is the most preserved country on the planet. Everything is mummified. Everything's in pyramids. The question of were there not enough graves in Egypt is saying, you do understand we are known for our graves. This is what we do. Like Egyptians, this is, this is their calling card. We make really good graves. We've got a lot of land for it. And we, we wrap people up and we put them in coffins. We're, we're good at it. So this is super sarcastic what they're saying to Moses. Oh, that wasn't good enough for you? So now we're gonna die out here. Look at verse 12. Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Here's what's interesting. The Israelites did say that at one point, but then things got really good for the Israelites. At first they were like, Moses, get out of here. You're making it worse for us. And then God set them free. So hours earlier, the Israelites are fleeing Egypt and the Egyptians are giving all of the Israelites all of their silver, gold, jewels, and livestock. Hours earlier, the Israelites were praising God for what he had done for them, slaves who were now millionaires. So yeah, at one point in their history, they did say to Moses, you should just leave us alone. But of recent memory, they really like Moses. In fact, we were told earlier that that Moses found Pharaoh with the Israelites. He found favor with the Israelites. So yeah, at one point they said it. Fear will make us distort our past and lose faith in the present. That's what fear does. Fear makes us reframe the things that have happened in the past. So we start to say things like, oh, well, I wish I would have. In the moment when you're afraid of an unknown future, of the uncertainty of what's coming, you're afraid of uh, financial collapse, sickness, whatever it is, what you begin to do is reframe a distorted past. 
and you begin to see things through a distorted lens. But notice this about them. The Israelites cry out to God, but they blame Moses. They cry out to God, but like us, they just needed somebody to blame for their issues. They didn't wanna cry out to God and blame him, and so they found Moses. And so Moses became the enemy. Because we always need somebody to blame, don't we? I mean, we like being the victim. And so we'd rather blame someone else than accept responsibility for our situation. So we wanna blame the government. We wanna blame society. We wanna blame the public school system. We wanna blame our parents or grandparents. We wanna blame the other political party. We wanna blame our spouse or our kids. We wanna blame a doctor or a hospital. We wanna blame some kind of social system. We wanna blame the church in the South. We wanna blame a pastor. We wanna blame video games or the internet. The truth is we like having someone to blame. Even if that someone is one of us. Moses was who God used to deliver them from slavery in Egypt. Moses was one of them. Moses was a Hebrew, an Israelite. We like having somebody to blame. And when things go crazy in our lives, we immediately turn our eyes to someone to blame. And we often blame the people closest to us. We blame our wife. We blame our husband. We blame an ex-wife or an ex-husband. We blame our kids or our parents. And man, we love to blame the world, don't we? We just need somebody to blame. But look how Moses responds to their accusations in verse 13. Moses said to the people, fear not. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. We talked about this last week. That be silent is not, it's not like a British, would you please pipe down? It's, it's shut up, would you just shut up, all of you? But the first thing Moses says, because he recognizes something, that their blame shifting, their anger, what's underneath it all is that they're a fearful people. And so this leader who months before was afraid to do anything God asked him to do, is now standing before two million accusers and telling them to shut up and not fear. But this is what Moses does. This is the response of Moses. Fear not, Yahweh will fight for you. Sometimes what we need is somebody to tell us what we already know. Because fear distorts even the present for us. And we can't see through the fact that God is who he says that he is. And we need someone to stand in front of us and say, don't be afraid. God has you. God's got you. This is what Moses does. We need this moment of coming to our senses, of awakening to what actually reality is. Then verse 15, the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Which tells me this about Moses. While Moses in front of the people seemed confident and fearless, God knew, if you were really fearless, you'd keep moving forward. But Moses has enough faith to say it, and then he just needs God to say, now go. Now you've said it, now go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea, and then watch what happens here in the language, and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. That's important too, they're going through on dry ground. More on that later. And verse 17, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. This repetition happens. Pharaoh, his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen happens over and over again as if God's not gonna leave anyone out. Verse 18, the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I've gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. So we have to address this fact here where God says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. I will stiffen it. I will make it stubborn. Because what's going to happen is Pharaoh will, because of his stubborn heart, lead the Egyptian army into the Red Sea where they will all be killed. So it seems unfair that God would hold Pharaoh responsible for something that God made Pharaoh do. That seems unfair. So let me give you just a few things to think about. 
First is this. After the plague of the firstborn, the 10th plague, the Passover plague, Pharaoh had a chance to repent. Pharaoh had his moment to turn his heart to the Lord, but instead he came after God's people. It's not like Pharaoh is begging God for grace and mercy. Pharaoh is saying, I don't need it. I got this. So I don't think God had to work very hard to harden Pharaoh's heart. I think he already had the wheels turning. And secondly is this. I would rather have a God who is in control of everything than a God who can be controlled by something. We're gonna talk about what gives us a chance at joy. What gives us a chance at joy is that God is in control and we can find peace and contentment in that. So Pharaoh had his chance and God is in control and God sends them in. We should rejoice at the sovereignty of God, not be afraid of it. We should rejoice that the God we serve is in control. We should rejoice at that. But notice, he's gonna divide the sea. He's making distinction between what will happen to the Israelites and what will happen to the Egyptians. Verse 19, then the angel of God who was going before the host of Israel, some would say the angel of God might've even been Jesus in flesh, but who was before the host of Israel moved and went behind them and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. Verse 20, coming between. So now what is the presence of God now stands between the people of Egypt and the people of Israel. God is making a distinction. If you remember the last seven plagues, God made a distinction between the Egyptians and the Israelites. God is drawing boundary lines. God is saying, I am on Israel's side. And now he's making this distinction again. There was the cloud and the darkness. Some of your translations say, essentially there was light on the side of the Israelites and darkness on the side of the Egyptians. And it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Here's this distinction being made. Then verse 21. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind. Circle that word, underline it. We're gonna come back to it. All night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand, there's a division, and on their left. So first is the idea of dry land. We need to understand what is actually being said here What's being said here is that the land was dry. It was dry land. What we want to do is we want to think, well, it doesn't really mean dry. It means like muddy. No, 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 no. It means dry, like concrete. It doesn't mean muddy. It doesn't mean like the, sh the shore of the sea. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean how the bottom of a lake feels where you're not sure you're gonna get your foot back. It's not like that. It's dry, like bone dry is kind of the Hebrew word here. This is how good God is to his people. He doesn't just divide the sea and give them some murky path to walk through. He gives them a paved road to walk through. So he divides the sea and it is dry ground. But I want you to look at this word wind. This moment would be talked about forever in the Hebrew Bible and to, for Jews to this day. This moment, this moment of their salvation, the Hebrew word being Yeshua, this moment of salvation was a seminal moment for them that they would write about and sing about. And they, whenever they wanted to be reminded of the power of God to save, they would go back to this moment. But what's awesome is that this was not a one-off for God. Like this is not the exception. This is the rule of his character. And here's how I know that. This word wind in verse 21 is the Hebrew word ruach. Say ruach. So it means wind, but it can also mean breath or spirit. The wind, the ruach of God, the breath of God, the spirit of God, it blows over water. Notice that. At the creation account, the first time we come in contact with these words, God is creating the world. And in Genesis 1, verse 2, we read that the earth was without form and void. And darkness, chaos, was over the face of the deep. What is the deep? It's water. And the spirit, the ruach, the breath, the wind of God was hovering over the face of the waters. 
And from that moment in creation, God began to sprout up dry land from the waters. This is what God does. This is his character. God, the spirit of God, separates the chaos of the waters and provides dry land for his people. He did it at creation. He does it here. He'll do it again in Joshua. He does it when Jesus walks on water. The very moment of baptism for us is symbolic of this very thing, of the spirit of God hovering over the waters and bringing life out of death. This moment that the Israelites cling to is not just a moment. This is the character of God. He brings order to chaos. So we don't have to fear. Because whatever seems chaotic in our lives, in your marriage and with your kids, whatever seems chaotic at work or, or in the social justice uh, realm, whatever seems chaotic in the court system, whatever seems chaotic in your public school, whatever seems chaotic, God is there and he is moving. We don't have to be fearful. This is his character. It's who he is and it's what he does. The people of Israel run through on the dry ground. Remember, two million people. So I know like we picture like a hundred meter sprint, everybody just running through. This is 2 million people. We got babies, we've got livestock, uh, we've got the more mature who don't walk as well as they used to because they did some gardening the day before. Now their back is out or they just slept wrong the night before. And now everything hurts. And so everyone's walking through. This happens over the course of a night. All night long, the spirit of God is holding back the waves and the winds the waters. And now, I love this, God compels the Egyptians to go in after them. And I'm not sure what's happening in their minds. Uh, I'll tell you this, I'm not going in. I would not. I'd be like, you guys go ahead. I'm, I'm going back. Because that's not, that doesn't look right. So we're not doing it. So Moses stretches out his arms again. And then verse 28, the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. Of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one remained. The Hebrew there is there was not one remnant. There was nothing. There was nothing left of the enemy. Nothing. God obliterated the enemy. Nothing was left. But, here's your distinction, the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea. The waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus, the Lord saved Yeshua. Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And then verse 30, Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Now, I know for many of you that just sounds really morbid, but here's what's beautiful about the grace of God. He let them see that enemy is defeated. You don't have to fear it anymore. I took care of it. It is finished. When they saw the bodies dead on the shore, they recognized, oh, that enemy has no power over me anymore. That's what they saw. They saw the death of the enemy. Verse 31, and Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. I know we don't like to think about this in our politically correct world, but there are enemies of God. There are. There are people who stand. There are forces and dominions in dark places that stand against the work of God. They are his enemies and God will use his power against them. In fact, many of us in the room today, we actually align more with the powers of darkness and the power of light today. And the truth of God's word is that God will not stand for it. And he used his power and the Israelites saw it. And because of that, verse 31, the people feared the Lord. They didn't fear the Egyptians. Why? Because they were all dead. They don't fear dead things. They feared the Lord and they believed, they trusted in the Lord and in his servant Moses. This is miraculous what's just happened here. People who just said, Moses, you should have left us back in Egypt. We'd rather be in slavery there than to die out here. Were those graves not good enough for you? Now they believe in Moses. Fear of the world becomes anger, but fear of the Lord becomes faith. So the question for us this morning is, which one do you have today? Are you angry? 
And are you running towards more anger? Because some of us just, just this afternoon are going to get home. We're going to do our Mother's Day stuff. And then you're going to pull out your computer, your phone, or your iPad, and you're going to get on social media, and you're going to look for a reason to get angry. I can't help you at that point. I'm trying to help you. You don't have to be frustrated all the time. You don't have to be on edge all the time. You don't have to be angry all the time. Anger comes from a fear of the world, and faith comes from a fear of of the Lord. But notice where this faith is in verse 31. It's both faith in Yahweh and faith in his people. I want to make a statement here and I want to make sure you hear what I'm saying and not what I'm not saying. I think anger is evidence of fear and fear is an evidence of a lack of faith. What I don't want you to hear me say is that if you're angry, it's because you don't have enough faith. You should get some more faith. I'm not saying that if you're wrestling with anxiety and depression, that the cure is just get some more faith, bro. What's your big deal? That's not what I'm saying at all. In fact, for some of us today, here's what I would say to you. There is a gift of modern medicine that's a miracle. And some of us, if it is crippling anxiety and depression, you need to see a doctor and let the gift of medicine Settle your heart in such a way that you have a shot to even have hope. I'm not saying you're not a good enough Christian. That's not what I'm saying at all. That's not what I'm saying. Please don't hear me say that. If you're looking for a reason to be angry, that's what you're gonna hear me say. But that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we have to grow our faith. And one way to know that we still have room to grow is when we are an angry people. That's what I'm saying. So let me give us some hope for us this morning. In Hebrews chapter 11, there's a whole list of people who had faith. And I want you to read this. Hebrews 11, verse 29. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land. Would you call that faith? You just read it with me. Is that faith? It seemed to me like, they're like fine, Moses, whatever. This is on you. This is on you. If we all die in this water, it's on you. Like, the author of Hebrews says, no, 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 it was faith that caused them to cross the Red Sea. This complaining, arguing, ungrateful, bitter, like <laughs> that's faith. And the author of Hebrews says, yes, yeah. You wanna know why? Because they did it. They were scared and they complained and they argued and they blamed Moses. But at the end of the day, they still walked across the Red Sea. They still did it. But the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. In other words, the Israelites had faith. That's why they made it. And the Egyptians did not. So based on Hebrews 11 and what we just read in this account in Exodus chapter four, what does faith look like? Here's what I believe faith is. Faith is belief lived out. That's what faith is. It's lived out. It's acted upon. It's in action. James would say it this way. Faith without works is dead. You can tell me you have faith by your words. I will show you I have faith by my works. Listen, you can talk all day long about how you have faith in Jesus. And then you can get on your social media, you can sit around the water cooler, you can go on a date with your wife and all you talk about is what you're angry about. And I would argue with you, you don't have faith. You've got a grandfather genie God, but you don't have faith in a powerful God who controls all things. Because if you did, if you did, it wouldn't matter who's in Washington. If you did, it wouldn't matter what the school system decides. It wouldn't matter if you really had faith in God. It wouldn't shape your emotions. You would have faith that God is who he says that he is. In 2 Timothy, Paul tells us this. He says that God did not give us a spirit of fear, but he gave us a spirit of power, of love, and of self-control. Notice those three things. Power, love, and self-control. You can't take one of those out. Like, you can't have power without love and control and say you have faith. No, no, no. You're just a punk. That's not what that is. Power and love without self-control 
makes you a social justice warrior. Power and love with self-control makes you a child of God. This is what we've been given, a power of love, of power, love, and self-control. Philippians chapter four, Paul says, here's how we should be known. Here's the distinction we make as followers of Jesus in our world. We rejoice in the world always. Again, I will say rejoice. Verse five, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. You know what a defining mark of a follower of Jesus is? We are reasonable people. We have grown in maturity and are so full of the fruit of the Spirit that we are actually a reasonable people. We can have reasonable dialogue and discourse. We don't get drawn in to the arguing and debating and yelling and screaming and anger of our day. We don't. We are a reasonable people. And how can we be a reasonable people? Verse five, because the Lord is at hand. How can we be reasonable in 2022? You gotta recognize Yahweh is near and he fights for his people. Mama, you know how you can be reasonable at home with your kids? Because God's near to your kids. God is there. They were his before they were yours. You know how you can be reasonable in your marriage? You know that God is at hand. Yahweh, he is who he is is there. The God who parted the Red Seas and provided dry land, that same God is actively working in your marriage and with your kids and at your workplace and in your schools and in your small group and on your, on your son's uh, baseball team and on your daughter's soccer team. God is there. He's working. That's why we can be reasonable. So then, verse six, don't be anxious about anything. Instead, by prayer and supplication, supplication being a list of requests, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And verse seven, the peace of God which passes understanding, which doesn't make sense, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. You wanna know why we're angry? Because we're looking for dishonorable, unjust, impure, unlovely, uncommendable, poor things. Let's fix our minds on these things. What you've learned and received and heard in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly now, that now at length you've received your concern, revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Look at verse 11. This is Paul. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, but I have learned in whatever season I am to be content. You wanna know how we move from being an angry people to being a faithful people? We find contentment. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Then verse 13, in context, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul is not saying, if I'm 5'1", I can dunk a basketball. Paul's not saying your 1A Christian football team is gonna beat the 6A football team. What Paul is saying in Philippians 4.13 is through Christ, you too can be content, no matter the circumstance. Romans 12, Paul says in verse 14, to bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. How's that going? Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty or arrogant but associate with the lonely. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. As far as it depends on you, don't be angry with everyone. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. I used to not know what to do with that verse because it feels like then I'm praying for God's vengeance upon people. And then I started reading the Psalms with a few guys and I recognized, you know what? David does this a lot. David says things like, destroy my enemies. Cut their heads off. So here's what's beautiful about verse 19. Whatever anger builds up in your heart because of sin in the world, 
whatever you're gonna do about it doesn't hold a candle to what God can do about it. So your social media posts, your rants about certain companies, that's fine, fine. You know what God does? God destroys Pharaoh, his horsemen, and his chariots, and you get to see the dead bodies on the seashore. That's what God does. I think God can handle it. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Verse 20, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. You know when you can't feed your enemy when you're angry at him? You know when you can't have an honest discourse with your enemy? When you're angry with them. Now this phrase, to heap burning coals on their head, people would have walked around and if they ran out of coals for their heating system in their home or wherever it was or their, or their kitchen, they would walk around with a bucket or a bowl and they would go house to house asking you to heap burning coals so that they could keep their fire going. That it would satisfy what they're looking for. But what happened oftentimes, the people who would come door to door looking for it would threaten those people. Like, you've got so much, give it to me. And they get mad at him and they uh, cause fights and quarreling. And what's being said here, what Paul is saying is, you know what, if you actually give people what they're looking for, they're not gonna know what to do with it. Like the person who's demanding that you respect them, if you actually respected them, they're like, well, I don't, well then, I don't know what, we're done. This is what he is saying. This is how we are to treat our enemies. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. So what do we do? Well, before that verse in 2 Timothy 1 about the spirit of fear, Paul says this, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. He's speaking of faith. I want you to fan into flame your faith, which is on you through the laying out of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. So we talked about this a few weeks ago. I feel like we need to say it again. We need to be doing things that fan the flames of faith, not the things of anger. So for some of us, we've got to get off of social media because it's not helping your faith. For some of us, we have to stop listening to certain podcasts and certain talk radio. We've got to stop because all it's doing is fanning the flame of your fear. Politics and entertainment thrive on fear. That's how they get us. Because if they can make you fearful and they say, then say they have the antidote to your fear, they've got you. Every political party does it. It's how it works. We need to avoid the things that fan fear and begin to fan the things that flame, that, or that begin to go to the things that fan, fan faith. Well, in Hebrews chapter 10, we learn clearly what that is. We hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. Why? Because he who promises faithful and let us consider how to stir up one another towards love and good works. Some of your translations there say, provoke one another. We're good at it, just not towards love and good works. Like, we're good at provoking one another. We know what to say, we know what to tweet, we know what to Facebook to provoke one another. I'm asking, do we do it towards love and good works? Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. What we do here in meeting together is meant to provoke our love and good works, not anger. So if you are ever, ever at a church where the teaching pastor is stoking the flames of fear, run. He needs to be stoking the, the flames of faith in you. If he's leveraging fear to keep you in his church, if he's leveraging fear to keep you obedient and faithful, run. That's a cult leader, not a pastor. We meet together encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Then look at this in verse 26. But if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. You wanna know why you continue in fear? Because you don't move towards faith. If we keep sinning, we're going to be fearful. If we walk with Jesus, we will be faithful. So let me wrap up by saying this. So here's what we need. I think our families and our world, we need more Moseses. We need someone to stand up and say, stop fearing. God is in control. We need a husband and a father to sit at his dinner table with his wife and kids 
and say, we will not be a family of fear. We're gonna walk in faith. I know it looks bad. I know I don't know what we're gonna do financially. I don't know how we're gonna handle this situation with our oldest or youngest or middle child. I know, I know. But we're not gonna operate out of fear. We're gonna do it in faith. We need a wife who will walk to her husband who just lost his job and say, baby, I know, but we're not gonna do this in fear. We're gonna do this in faith. We need a family to stand and say, I know, we've approached this. We're putting our kids in this school and we're not gonna do it out of fear. We're gonna do it out of faith. That's what we need. We need people to stand and cut through the clutter and the chaos and say, no, 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 no. We are not a fearful people. We are a faithful people. And when we are a faithful people, we are a joyful people. And joyful people are attractive to the world. Joyful people give the world something to talk about and want to be drawn into. Angry people sound just like everyone else. So let's not forsake gathering together. Let's stir one another up towards love and to good works. And let's stand up like Moses and make a cry for faith over fear. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes and we'll wrap up this morning. I don't know where you find yourself today. I don't know what is happening in you, but I know enough of what's going on in our culture to know that everywhere you turn, someone is trying to stoke the flames of your fear. And I just want us to be honest about how deeply it's gotten into our souls. And the number one indicator that fear has made its way deep into our bones is that we are an angry person. No matter where we are, we're angry. We're on edge. Things set us off. And sure, well, I'm just tired. No, 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 no. It's deeper than that. So we've grown comfortable with the anger because it makes us feel like we're in control and we don't wanna dig underneath that. You don't wanna know what's underneath it is that you're afraid of something. And I know, men, you don't wanna believe it, but you are. You're afraid of something happening at home. You're afraid of something being exposed about you. You're afraid of the impact of the world. You are fearful and that fear is making you wrangle for control and in wrangling for control, you've become angry. And women in losing control over your kids and losing control um, over certain, certain situations at home or at work, you also have become angry. And here's the gift of anger. It tells us that we have put our faith in something other than Jesus. And the beauty of confession and repentance is that we get to come back to faith in Jesus. We get to come back home. You don't have to be angry today. You don't have to be fearful today. Because the same God who parted the Red Sea is the same God who hovered over the waters of the deep of creation, the same God who parted uh, the River Jordan, the same God who walked on water, that very same God who is who he says that he is, Yahweh, is near. And you're gonna be okay. Because we're gonna be okay, we can be joyful. So I just wanna invite you today to give it to God. Find the prayer of the father in the New Testament in Luke chapter nine, whose um, son was possessed. And God said, well, you need more faith. And the man says to him, I believe, help my unbelief. That's our prayer today. Father, we are a people who are desperate to find you. But truth be told, sometimes we feel like it's hard. And for many of us, what's happened is that we've lifted our eyes and all we see is the enemy, all we see is darkness, and we haven't seen that you made a distinction. You've set us apart. And because you've set us apart, you will fight for us. And if you are for us, then who can be against us? Because I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And so today, God, would you stir, provoke um, the flame of faith in us today? Give us reason to believe. Give us somebody to stand before us and say, you can believe because I went through that too and God got me through it. In our small groups today, God, give us conversation about faith, conversation that empowers and equips. Draw us back to your power that we might see the dead enemy on the seashore today to remind us that he has no power over us. It is finished. Give us 
a spirit of power and love and self-control. In Jesus' name, amen.